production featuring Aizawa. Why is it that whenever I write an Aizawa fanfiction, the stories are getting kind of weird? It's like I don't respect him, even though I do. He's actually one of my favorite characters. Then why do I put him through shit like, well, for example, in this story? I should probably just write some vanilla with him someday. I hope I can do that. Anyways, take that as a little intro to that. But before we get right into it, I would like to remind you that I have a Patreon and a merch store. I would greatly appreciate it if you could check both of them out. Of course, there's the chance that you cannot support me monetarily. In that case, I would simply ask you to watch the video until the end, like or dislike it, and if you're new here and think I'm worth it, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Lastly, if you want to help me even more, share the video around, post it everywhere you can. Uh, for example, a Discord server that is themed after Boku no Hero, uh, to your anime friends, just in general, anywhere. Do the thing that YouTube doesn't want to do, because I'm not mainstream yet. Um, so yeah, m make Susan do her job. <laughs> Alright, let's get right into the story. Your days were simple. Cooking, cleaning, washing. If a few years ago your best friend would have told you you would become the trad wife of a pro hero, you would have laughed, maybe even slapped them. But now here you were, preparing dinner while longingly staring at your husband's photo while you were cutting onions. Just three years ago, the two of you started dating. At the time, you were a low-life criminal, stealing liquor and snacks from grocery stores, mostly for the thrill of it. But by now, you just felt guilty about it. You two started dating for sheer accident he had caught you red-handed while hiding booze inside your coat. And he had offered to pay for it. Under the condition that you'd be willing to go on a date with him. Of course, at the start, he just used it as an excuse to figure you out. Learn if you were a lost cause or worth putting some effort into. He was charming and flirty. He talked quite open about his job as the pro hero erasure head and his side business as a teacher at the prestigious UA Academy. You hung on his lips. Every word sounded like honey. In a way you were glad your only dating experience so far were just two guys in high school. So you didn't have many people to compare him to and desire to see if you can find someone better was simply not there. With a pleased smile, you swung around and put down the dishes. This was a special occasion. Your first anniversary as a married couple. Everything was perfect. So you sat down and waited. Patiently. You watch the candle you put in the middle of the dining table slowly go down. As worry began to envelop your stomach and heart. A feeling that wouldn't subside even after you heard the noise of keys sliding into the drawer of your shared apartment. Like a ghost, your husband, Shota Aizawa, entered the corridor not acknowledging the lit-up kitchen and heading straight for the bathroom. Your eyes widened in fear and you jumped from your seat, chasing after him. 
You didn't lock the door, but you paused, your hand floating just above the doorknob. What you heard behind that door filled you with fear. The unmistakable sound of him vomiting was the only thing you heard. Had he been drinking? No, no, he never drank. He didn't even order wine for himself while you two entered your high-class dating stage. Finally, you mustered the courage to speak up. Honey, are you alright? Of course he wasn't alright. What were you thinking, asking that? Should I call an ambulance? Between his nauseating noises, he managed to press out a grumble of disapprovement. So no ambulance. Can I come in? No answer. You patiently waited until you heard the shower turn on. You gently opened the door. As our clothes were tossed aside on the ground, they were sticky. You shifted your attention to him. He was washing off blood of his naked body, and you gasped. He didn't acknowledge you. His eyes were closed as the water ran down him. With an unsure pitter-patter, you undressed yourself and stepped behind him. He didn't speak, nor did you. At least, there were no wounds. Your arms wrapped around his slender waist. He was cold, despite the hot water. You knew something awful must have happened, something that he shouldn't deal with alone. He lost himself into your warm embrace, feeling his rapid heartbeat slow down, and the sickening feeling in his gut turning into a light pounding inside his head. Do you want to talk about it? You whispered into his ear. And he shook his head, tickling your face with his hair. You remained in this position for a while. You didn't count the time, and you didn't care. All you knew is that eventually you found yourself in your bedroom. Usually he was the big spoon, but tonight he was the little one. He still hasn't spoken yet. Until you had almost fallen asleep, and his sharp voice turned you wide awake. You don't see a lot of shit in the line of duty. He began. His voice was hoarse. Especially heroes like me. He paused for a moment. I work very close with the police, it, it honestly makes me feel a bit safer knowing there's a group of armed men as backup, knowing that should I die, the villain we're after as soon as a gun pressed to his face. He hid his face behind his hands. We're after this sick fuck. You could tell by his voice that he was crying. Serial killer, whose deeds were held under lock and key. You'd be surprised how many of these monsters are out there, and the media never hearing about it. He sighed. Do you remember our trip to the International Museum of Arts? You blinked. This seemed like a sudden change of subject. Yes, honey. It had been a lovely evening day. The museum had been built on a scenic island off the coast. It was connected by a ferry service. 
The building itself looked modern on the outside, and was filled with both originals and copies of world-famous paintings, statues, and photographs. Of course, the copies were marked. What about it? You asked. It's so you can imagine it easier. You gulped. This freak. This monster. He kidnapped people. Tortured them. Killed them. And then propped them up like those ancient oil paintings. Shota tried to give a sarcastic chuckle. But only managed to gag. I can never look at the Mona Lisa the same again. Your mind filled itself with grotesque imagery following his descriptions. He was in a side room. At the end of a blood-stained hallway. A girl bound and gagged on a chair. Oh no, you thought. Poor thing. The guy was wearing a blindfold. Dancing, begging the girl to scream her lungs out, calling her screams of terror poem without words. He gave a quiet sob. I was seeing red. I had just traversed a bizarre mockery of art, and now seeing this child, I couldn't control myself. As if God himself wanted this piece of shit wiped off the world, there was a wrench lying right next to the entrance of that room. That... that cursed room. <laughs> he sniffled. He didn't notice me. And I hit him on the head. Knocking him out. Then I unbound the child, told her to leave the room and cover her eyes. Your stomach turned. You were glad you skipped dinner with him. She closed the door behind herself. And I kept baiting and baiting this monster with that bloody wrench. He rubbed his eyes. You had tries to teach you how to act like a true hero. What it doesn't teach is that there's a difference between a villain and a true criminal. He turned his head and glanced at you. The difference is a villain always comes off as ever so slightly silly, no matter what they do. You hear the word villain, you imagine a bald guy petting a cat, laughing maniacally, and talking about taking over the world. And a criminal? That's when it gets serious. That's when you need guys with guns. Aizawa rolled his head back into a comfortable position. Eventually three cops pulled me off of him. Pushed me outside. There were about five others already sick of what they'd witnessed. I wasn't reprimanded. Got a few claps on my shoulder. Reassurance. I. I was assured I'm not going to lose my license, but that doesn't change the fact that I failed and won. I, I failed successfully. There's a saying in, in hero culture. When you kill for the first time, you walk through the door, you get hooked, you become more than just a glorified police officer, you become a judge, a jury, an executioner. You gently brushed with one hand through his hair. 
desperately hoping it would soothe his mind. He deserved it. He stopped. He was no longer able to speak. You kissed the back of his head and finally spoke up. You will not turn into a vigilante. You're honorable and disciplined. A wonderful man, great teacher and amazing lover. What I will say now might sound harsh, but you will heal. Get over it. Not tonight. Not tomorrow. Or maybe not even this year or the next. But it will happen. Now just... Take your time. You huddle closer to him. And if nothing helps, visit a specialist. He slowly opened his tired eyes, staring out the window that he was facing. He felt as if he needed to get over this by himself, that if he managed to survive this on his own, that that meant truly being a pro. He thought of his students. If they were to find out about this, would they see him in a different light? Mock him? Call him a hypocrite? Or would they be like you? Giving nothing but comforting words. Yet why? Why did it feel so shallow and empty? Once again, he felt your lips press into the back of his head. And he blinked. Was your embrace always feeling so warm, soft and comforting? He silently chuckled to himself. No, of course not. It always was like that. It's just that he went through something. And the something made him appreciate your presence even more.